let's put this title up here. Lordship, ownership, stewardship. We started this probably a month ago now, talking about this. When I initially felt led of the Lord to go into a new series as I was finishing up my last one, I felt on my heart the subject of stewardship. And the longer I began to seek the Lord, the longer I began to, <laughs> began to get into the Word and find out what He wanted me to say, the subject of lordship and ownership came up. And I felt like we cannot adequately talk about stewardship without talking about lordship and ownership. And so these last few weeks, we've been really talking about lordship. Let, let's put these up. Now, this is review, and then we'll pick up where we left off last week. Two portions of Scripture that still shake me today. As long as I've been serving the Lord, how many of you have some Scriptures that when you read it, you're like, oh, man, that still convicts me no matter how long I've been saved. Anybody have any Scriptures? James chapter 2, verse 19 is one of those. It says, you believe that there is one God you do well, but the devils also believe and tremble. Of course, James chapter 2 talks about the fact that it's one thing to just declare that God is who he says he is, but it's another to live it out. Faith without works is dead. And so we talked about that last week as we broke down the word believe us and what that really means. Let's put up this next one, Bill. This is the other scripture that shakes me. We talked about this last week. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Of course, last week we broke that down in the chapter. It said, many shall come to me in that day and say, Lord, we did this in your name. We did that in your name. In your name. We did it in your name. And the Lord said, those are two verses that are very convicting, but I think they get to the heart of this whole subject of lordship. Let's put this up here, Bill. Now, this is what we talked about last week, lordship, and, and, and we'll kind of continue this today, but the word lordship means the position of authority of a lord, all power and all authority, the top rank, to rule or have dominion, to rule all territory. For the Christian, it means that I acknowledge ownership and I give up all personal rights by yielding to Christ's lordship, giving unreserved obedience in essence. If he is lord, then we do what he tells us. And so we covered that last week. And then we talked about ownership. Now, the definition of ownership is legal right to have possession, proprietorship, to have exclusive right or title to something because you have legal possession of it. And then we gave the definition of stewardship, a surrogate who manages the property, estate or financial affairs of another, the responsibility to oversee or to protect something. Now, let's put this next one up here. We ended with this. If we understand what I just explained, there are some things in our life that need to be settled. Lordship will settle the position issue, the permission issue, the profession issue, and the possession issues of my life. Now, let's put this next one up. This is where we're going today. So what is lordship? What does it mean? What's, what's the practicality of lordship? Well, today we're going to talk about lordship is accepting God's sovereignty, and we're going to explain that. I don't know if we'll make it very far past that because I've got some deep stuff I want to go into, but this is kind of the roadmap of hopefully where we're headed. Lordship is a God-first life. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? God first. Lordship accepts responsibility and accountability. Lordship is also doing God's will, not just knowing God's will, but doing God's will. You, 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 I, I, a lot of people would probably sit back and go, really? And, and when I say, yeah, there's a lot of people in the church today that talk a lot about knowing God's will, but a lot of people are not engaged in God's will. Lordship settles that. You're doing it. And then we end this thought, Lordship is personal obedience no matter what. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the worship. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that's here today. And Lord, I thank you for everyone that's here today that chose to fellowship and love on one another, pray for one another, worship together corporately. Lord, I thank you for those that gave in the offering. And Lord, we pray your blessing be on it in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, as we transition... Get a hold of our ears that we have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Get a hold of our heart that we receive the seed of your word. 
And Father, I'm believing that your grace is going to move through me and you're going to empower me to teach, to preach, to instruct, to do whatever it is you need me to do today with this word. And Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit touch lives, open ears, give us an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us personally through this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want you to look at this first point again in that breakdown. Bill, let's put that back up here. I want you to write this down because I'm going to explain it. What is lordship? Lordship is accepting God's sovereignty. I'm going to explain that. Let's put this slide up here. Now, the word sovereign means possessing supreme or ultimate power, uh, acting or done independently or without outside interference. If any of you are word nerds like me, um, synonyms are supreme, absolute, unlimited, unrestricted, boundless, ultimate, total, unconditional, full, independent, autonomous, self-governing, self-determining, or free. Now, I'm just going to get this out of here before we dissect this. God's sovereign, you're not. Oh, now, pastor, I, I would never, ever say that I was sovereign like God. Well, <laughs> if you're not submitted to the sovereignty of God, then you, you are sovereign in a human way. See, God doesn't have to get with us and ask our point of view when he gives a decision on something. God didn't consult with us, never consulted with man, doesn't consult with us. His word is ultimate authority. It's independent of, of, of the world. It's independent of the human mind and human rationale. And God has all authority. He has all power. Matter of fact, when you, when you go a little bit deeper, um, it, it basically means God can do anything he wants. When he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, the way he wants to do it. Well, let's put up this next slide. Well, well, let's talk about this. How does the sovereignty of God impact my everyday life then? I mean, pastor, I, I, I realize that there is only one God and he created the universe and I realize he has all power and all authority. Yeah, but there's a difference between saying that and submitting to it. Let me say that again. There's a difference between saying Jesus is sovereign. He has all power. He has all authority. His name is above every name. And that at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will come back. It's one thing to say it. Boy, it's quite another to submit to it. Let's go to the, put this, this, this next slide. Here's some quotes I came across. A.W. Pink, in his study on the sovereignty of God, said this. He said, no revolving world, no shining of star, no storm, no creature moves, no actions of men, no errands of angels, no deeds of the devil. Nothing in all the vast universe could come to pass otherwise than God has eternally purposed. Here is the foundation of faith. Here is a resting place for the intellect. Here is an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. It is not blind fate or unbridled evil, man or devil, but the Lord Almighty who's ruling the world, ruling it according to his own good pleasure and for his own eternal glory. And this is where we're going to go to here in just a second. Let's put that other quote up here. This is the awesome thing. God chose to write a love letter to us and explain what his will is. So when we think about the sovereignty of God and the power of God as his children, as joint heirs with Christ, God has actually explained what that means in his word and how you, as part of the household of faith, are connected to it. Oh, man. Jerry Bridges says, prayer assumes the sovereignty of God. If God is not sovereign, we have no assurance that he's able to answer our prayers. That's, that's powerful. Our prayers would become nothing more than wishes. But while God's sovereignty, along with his wisdom and love, is the foundation of our trust in him, prayer is the expression of that trust. 1 John chapter 5 says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, he receives the petitions that have been brought to him. And we're going to talk about this here in just a second. Because the power of God has been revealed through his word, and we got to learn the power of that word and how to use it as a child of God. Go to the next quote. A.W. Pink came in again, and he said, 
Divine sovereignty is not the sovereignty of a tyrannical despot, but the exercised pleasure of one who's infinitely wise and good. Because God is infinitely wise, he cannot err. And because he's infinitely righteous, he will not do wrong. Here then is the preciousness of this truth. The mere fact itself that God's will is irresistible and irreversible fills me with fear. But once I realize that God wills only that which is good, my heart is made to rejoice. See, that quote right there is what helps us understand the bridge of not just acknowledging his sovereignty and his power, but submitting to it. Because when you learn to submit to it, then you learn, Loren, to trust in it. I don't have to fear anything because God is all powerful and nothing goes without his eye seeing it. Nothing goes without his ears hearing it. Nothing goes on in my life. If his eye is on the sparrow, then his eye is on me. He knows everything that not only has happened, but is happening, but is going to happen. And when you pray the prayer of trust, you resign over to him everything in your life, which is what lordship is. And it's learning to trust. Let's put this last one up here. Ephesians chapter 1. Oh, boy. Let's go there. Let's look at this. Ephesians chapter 1. Now, before I do this, I want to go a little deeper. Because nothing happens outside of God's rule, authority, and control. We've learned that. But nothing happens also without his permission. And this is what's key. Because, see, we got a lot of believers that are looking at the word of God and they're looking at the promises of God and they're looking at the power of God and then they're wondering, well, if that's true then, pastor, if, if nothing goes on without his permission, then why are things going on in my life that I didn't give permission to it? Does that make sense? Is that a reasonable question to ask? I mean, why is this happening? I'm going to tell you why. Many times this is the key. It's because you didn't submit to his sovereignty. Because every time you fail to submit to his sovereignty, which is what his lordship and his power, when you fail to submit to it, other things that aren't God's will have the opportunity to work its way in your life. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. When you don't submit to the lordship of Jesus, when you, when you don't submit to his ultimate power and authority, then you open the door. This is what happened. You give permission to the enemy to do things that God has already given you the authority to stand against. But in your failure to submit to the lordship of Jesus, through your disobedience, you've left an open door to the enemy to come in and do what he wants to do. That's why there's a difference between acknowledging the sovereignty of God and submitting to the sovereignty of God. Am, am I making any, is this making any sense? I'll prove it to you. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Amen. Now, verse 3. Now, I'm going to read some heavy verses here, so just stick with me. Verse 3, I love this, explains it. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. So here we've got a sovereign God that doesn't answer to man. He's independent. He's given us his word. In his word are promises. Now that we're his children, now that we've submitted to Jesus, I accept you as Savior, but now I'm, I'm acknowledging you as my Lord, and I'm going to live according to that. And because of that, there's blessings that come to me. Come on. There's blessings. And so Paul is, is, is making this prayer. He said, oh, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus. He's blessed me with spiritual blessings. Where are they at? In heavenly places, under his sovereign rule. Verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5. Now, a lot of times people take this out of context when they talk about predestination. And I know that's deep, and I didn't want to take a deep dive in that today. I'll explain it just here in a second so you kind of understand what that means. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So does that mean that God has predestined people to go to hell? No. This is what it means. Through Jesus, he made opportunity for all to avoid hell. Are you getting this? 
So because he made opportunity, that means he predestinated you. But not everybody's going to make it to heaven, are they? There's going to be some people that go to hell. Not God's will. God made a way. And God said, if you trust in me and submit to my sovereignty and submit to my lordship and submit to my authority, you can avoid this through the predestination of, of what, I, what I provided for you to avoid it. But if you don't submit to it, then the thing that I predestined for you to enjoy will never be a reality in your life. Did I make some sense there? He died for all, but not everybody's going to accept the invitation. Jesus said, narrow is the gate that leads to salvation, but broad is the gate that leads to destruction. Jesus died for everybody. Predestinated everybody to be a children of God, the children of God, according to his good pleasure, but not everybody's going to enjoy it. Does that make sense? Are you seeing this? Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Once again, God made a way. Not everybody is forgiven. Not everybody has been redeemed. If you're lost, you've not applied, listen, what God has provided. He provided it, but not everybody's forgiven. Not everybody's redeemed through the blood of Jesus. Why? Because they've not submitted to the riches of his grace. Go to the next verse. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom, in prudence, having made known. This, this, is, this is where I'm really getting at. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, remember God is sovereign, does everything according to his good pleasure, doesn't consult with us before he does it. He does it because he's sovereign, has all authority, he's independent of man, can do everything he wants to do, however he wants to do it, right? But because we're now his children, oh, this is so awesome. God lets us peek behind the veil, and he begins to reveal to us a little bit about his sovereignty. And, and the Lord begins to reveal to us all of the wonderful, precious promises that come to us if we choose to submit to his lordship. <laughs> if you choose to submit to my lordship, I'll make known to you the mystery of my will. You know, it, 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 sometimes when people... Now, if you do this, I love you. Um, I, I read the book of Revelations. That's not what it's called. The last book of the Bible is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's called. And you know, when you read the first chapter in that, it says, blessed is everyone who reads it because the Holy Spirit will give understanding to those that choose it. So I, I thought the book of Revelations was all about end time events, just a small portion of it. Really, if you look at it through the eyes of the Holy Ghost, you see the history of all the universe, creation, and you're going to see how this thing's all wrapped up. And then you see who Jesus is. And then you see his relationship with the church. It's all one big revelation. If you choose to be a Christian, then the Lord will reveal to you the mysteries of his own. Why did I say that? Because some of you need to understand even the parts of the word that seem confusing to you. If you submit to the lordship of Jesus, the blinders will come off your eyes and the Holy Spirit will come alongside you. And he'll be your guide and your teacher. And he'll show you things that man could not tell you. And he'll show you things far beyond your intellect. Why? Because you submitted to the sovereignty of God. I submitted to his authority. And because I submitted to his authority, he's made known unto me. Is that your opinion? No, that's what verse 9 of Ephesians 1 says. That's not my opinion. But the reason why people are in church are walking around confused is because they don't know the mystery of his will. And they don't know his good pleasure. And they don't know what he, he's purposed in our life in him. Why? Because they refuse to submit to his lordship. Are y'all here today? Listen, I've been pastoring almost 30 years, and in those 30 years, one thing without fail, without fail across the board is present in the lives of people who don't hunger and thirst for righteousness, in the life of people who choose to not submit themselves to the lordship of Jesus and choose to live compromising lives without fail. I don't care how long somebody's been in church or how religious they look when they come to church or how religious they sound, without fail, they're very shallow in their walk with the Lord. 
And I don't say that mean. I say that to expose the truth so you could learn the key to having, having known the mysteries of God. So, so you could learn the key to understand his purposes and what his good pleasure is. It will make sense through the Holy Ghost, but it only comes when you submit to his sovereignty and his reign. Does that make any sense? Well, let me tell you this. God didn't reserve revelation to those who don't hunger for it. He reserved revelation for those that hungered for it with everything in them. It's just the way the kingdom works. Verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in all, one, one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, and even in him. Now we're going to read to verse 11. And then in verse 11, he comes in and he says, that the God of our Lord, oh, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance. Here's the word again, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things. Here it is, after the counsel of whose will? His will. He's the one that came up with the plan of salvation. He's the one that came up with the way of salvation. You know, it's, it's funny because nowadays, uh, truth is hate speech. It, it's funny. If you just declare what the word says, people will look at you and they'll be, that's hateful. Oh, that's, not, that, that's not hateful. I'm just telling you what the word says. You can't call that sin. Yes, I can. How can you? Because the word says it is. You can't tell people that if they don't know Jesus, they're not going to make it to heaven. Yes, I can. How can you? Because I didn't say it. Jesus said it. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. You know, when you start touching on this, you know what it does? It exposes the state of the church today. There are churches that are not submitting to the sovereignty of God. They're not submitting to the lordship of Jesus. They're allowing doctrines in that aren't even in the word, that are contrary to the truth of his word that's already settled in heaven. And if we submit to his sovereignty, which means I submit to his authority, if I submit to his authority, then I submit to the authority of what he said in his word. Why? Because he works all things according to the counsel of his will and not mine. And the Bible says that if I add to and take away, that I'll be cursed. And, and this is what happens. Churches are choosing to rewrite Scripture that's already settled in heaven. You, oh, Jesus, you can't, you can't rewrite that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I, it, 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 you ever talk with somebody and just within a few seconds you realize they don't understand the word. You hear their, you hear their theology and you're, 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 listen, I love you in Jesus, but man, oh man. And, and you try to witness to people and, you, and they'd wanna, they want to argue scripture with you and you're like, oh my goodness. That's not even, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about. But unless the Holy Spirit gives revelation to them, they won't know, well, how's it going to happen? they got to live a life of submission. See, this is why I learned a long time ago. I didn't learn it the first few years I was a pastor. But I eventually learned it. People are going to do what they want to do. Oh, I'm going to say that again. Before you got it. People are going to do what they want to do. If a life is not submitted to the supreme authority of God, they're not going to listen to you. And, and as a pastor, I used to beat my head up against I, I used to get so frustrated trying to lead and trying to pastor and, and you know, rogue sheep just kind of doing their own thing and wondering why people aren't committed and people aren't faithful. And, I'm sitting, and the Lord had to give me a check on that and, and, and tell me, hey, listen, Dennis, listen. If they won't submit to me and my word, they're not going to listen to you. People are going to do what they want to do. And so I've learned as a shepherd what my job is. I'm just going to obey the word. I'm just going to obey what the word says, outlined in Scripture, because God's the supreme authority. He didn't, God didn't sit with me and say, hey, let's write up the, um, 
Um, let's write the job description of what being a pastor is. What do you think about that, Dennis? Or, or here's a good one. How the church is supposed to be ran. It, Jesus didn't reappear this last generation that has chosen to do things contrary to Scripture and sit down with the modern church and say, hey, listen, we need to talk about this. Times are changing, and we got to find a better way to do church. Because people don't cut, the people don't assemble anymore, and people just they're just not committed anymore. So how can we package this thing to where we don't offend people? How can we package this thing to where we we just don't tell the truth anymore? And how can we package this where the Holy Spirit doesn't have rule and reign in, in a church service, and 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 people just don't need to be accountable anymore? I, how can we package this? No, he didn't do that. What God did is he said, "I'm." Sovereign, I have supreme authority, I rule and reign, I do it after the counsel of my own will, and I'm going to write in my Bible exactly, not only what your inheritance and your blessings are, but how you're supposed to live your life. And there's no debate on this. Because the moment, I want you to hear me, the moment you choose to rebel against what God has written, and here's clear word, you've now become sovereign, and there's only one sovereign. And we're not that. We're not independent. Let's go to the, well, that, that went over really good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 17. Verse 17. Amen. This is, this is, I, I want, okay. I understand that many of you come to church and there are sometimes you hear a message and you just don't get it. I understand that. I remember when I first got saved, I'd leave church and I'd be like, what in the world is the pastor talking about? <laughs> right? Why? Because I was born again. I was, I, was on the, I was on the bottle, I was on the milk, there's no way I could have eaten a steak. Right? And so I had to get to a place to where my growth was able, my hunger, listen, my submission. See, I want you to hear me. You'll accept truth with a submitted heart. Might not understand it, might not want to do it, might not know all the details, but you'll submit to truth with a submitted heart. Does that make sense? And so no matter what stage you are in your walk with the Lord, whether some of you are on the milk or on the meat, with a submitted heart, you'll submit to the truth. Might not like it. Come on, come on, be honest. Anybody ever read something and you're like, Lord, I don't like this, but I'll submit to you because I love you more than getting my own way. Whew, wow. Wow. Is everybody okay today? Do we need to do a health check? Amen. Do, do, do we need to take a pause and say, everybody take their blood pressure, make sure everybody's okay. Amen. Let's do a heart rate count. Amen. 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 You're listening. That's what it is, right? It's, it's, it's settling. Amen. See, I've learned, I learned a long time ago. I can get up and, and, and preach my opinion, you know, for four, you know, 30, 40, an hour. And I could preach my opinion. And, and it's not going to do any work. But if I got the word to back me up, and I got exact, and dissect and cross-reference and balance it out and rightly divide the truth, then it's the word that you're hearing, not my opinion. So he comes in in verse 17, he says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you. This is it. This is it. I got to hurry because there's some things I want to say before we close. This is it. When I submit to his sovereignty, his independent rule, when I submit to how God chooses to do things, which means I'm submitting to his sovereignty, supernaturally in my life, I begin to understand with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I, listen, some of you want to, if you want to know the key to spiritual growth, just learn how to live a submitted life. That's it. That's it. Live a submitted life. Because when you choose to do that, then God gives you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Verse 18. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll finish this out. We'll go to verse 23. And that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. How many of you want that? Come on, isn't that some awesome promises right there? Awesome promises. But it doesn't come to those that... That, that refuse to live a submitted life. 
I mean, I don't say this in a bad way. Jesus used the term throwing pearls before swine. Now, this is what he meant. Swine don't understand the difference between a rock and a pearl. They just trample over it. People that don't understand the depth of riches that come through revelation, they don't know how to treat it as a pearl. They'll treat it like a rock. They'll sit in a church service and just leave unchanged. They'll read their Bible, and God's throwing pearls their way, and they're just treating them like rocks. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Verse 20. This is awesome. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his, in, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Keep going to verse 23. Far above all principality. Here it is. Here's the sovereignty again. Supreme authority. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Verse 22. And has put all things under his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things. Oh, this is what we're getting ready to bridge into. He's the head of the church. Anything with more than one head's a freak. He's the head. Why? He earned it. Why? Because he was a spotless lamb and met the requirements of the Father. And because he met the requirements of the Father, he destroyed all enemies, death, hell, and the grave. Destroyed all principalities. Destroyed it all. And when he rose on the third day, he proved death couldn't even hold him. Why? Because he's sovereign and he's supreme authority and he's above it all. And now it has given Jesus the right to rule and reign over his church because he earned it. And because he earned it, I must submit to it. And if I don't choose to submit to it, I'm going to miss out on all these things that God intended for me, even though he predestined it for me. How many people are going to stand before the Lord and the Lord will show them the life they could have had but chose not to have because they didn't want to live a submitted life? Pastor Adam gets up here every week and does an amazing job in leading us and in, in giving and gives us scripture every week and in, in examples and testimonies. But yet we'll walk out of church. I'm not going to submit my finances to you. You're going to miss out on a blessed life. Oh my goodness, you're missing out. I'm called of God. Submit yourself to the Lord. It's amazing. People come into church. I'm called of God. Here's some requirements. I want to meet that. You ain't the boss of me. I don't answer to man. I answer to God. Yeah, but if you answer to God, you answer to those he's placed over you. Because he's sovereign. He wrote the rules. I didn't write it. I didn't write it. Are you getting this? So are you now seeing this a little bit more? Which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, this is the issue, okay? If we read the Bible and understand anything about God, we, we should, if you didn't before this service, hopefully now you understand he has all rule. He has all authority and he has all control. And I get that. If God didn't, the universe would explode right now. Boom. Because he's the one who holds it together. He's the reason why this planet doesn't explode. You know, it's funny hearing everybody go on about, you know, climate change and, and global. No, no, you kidding me? The Bible tells us that, that, that this world is in the palm of God's hand. And, and nothing happens except he say it happened. And my Bible says that that isn't the way this world's going to end. So I'm not worried about it. But if we don't understand lordship, okay, how do we make it personal? This is how we make it personal. He does rule, but have we let him rule us? He does have all authority, but have we let him have all authority over us? He does have all control, but does he control us? Only when we resign over to God everything does his perfect will come to pass in our lives. 
Any time in my life that the perfect will of God is not coming to pass, I can't blame God because he's sovereign and has all authority. What I have to do is say, have I laid aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset me? God predestined me to walk this life. God predestined me to walk out this calling. God predestined me to enjoy this, but I stand in the way. Why? Because I could allow weights and sins in my life to hinder the path God laid out for me. It's funny, I hear people all the time, things happen and they go, well, it must have been God's will. What, you didn't factor in there the fact that you chose to live a compromised life? You didn't kind of include that into the understanding of why this is happening to you? That, that maybe you're not living a submitted life? Maybe, maybe God just chose not to bless rebellion. I don't, I don't know. Is anybody here with me? I, I, listen, 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 listen. You think I haven't seen this? You think I haven't seen this in church? Not, not just in, but in the ministry. People through the years, I see, I'm doing my own. Go ahead and do your own thing. Whew, let's see how that works out for you. I, l- listen, when the world's falling apart around you, and it will happen, now I'm going to get away with that. no. Jesus, you better watch those words. I'm going to do what I want to do, the way I want to do it, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. That's just how it's going to be. I'm telling you, (laughs) it's not going to work out for you. Let's put this next scripture up here. Ezekiel 12, 28. Therefore saith unto them, thus says the Lord God, there shall be none of my words be prolonged anymore. But the word which I have spoken shall be done, thus says the Lord God. God's given me a promise, Pastor. How come it's not coming to pass? It's not because God didn't say it was not going to come to pass. You have to inspect your own life. And say, if God's not a God that he should lie, and he is sovereign, and no one can control or rule him, if I didn't submit to his life, maybe that's why the word didn't come into pass. And maybe if I choose to submit this to the Lord, then the word will now be able to go forth unhindered. When I came here 22 years ago, there were some things that I know the Lord spoke to me, and I I know it because it lined up with his word and other people spoke and it was confirmed for the mouth of two or three witnesses. But there were some things that happened along the way that delayed the manifestation of what God had promised. My own stupidity and immaturity and things that happened in the life of other people, it just all worked together. And so people wonder, I want you to hear, I'll make this personal from a pastor's perspective. People wonder why, as a pastor, I choose to do things the way I do it. I'm going to tell you why. Because I answer God. And anything that's going to stand in the way of what I know God's will is for this church, whether, whether it's rebellion or whether it is compromise, uh, or whether it's die vision, two vision, separate from the vision God gave, no matter what it is. I can't allow it to happen because what will happen is I will delay the rule of God and what he wants done in this congregation. And you would think every church around the world would want leadership like that. Not so. Because you you want to know why they made a golden calf? Because they wanted a God that can be controlled. Moses is in the mountain receiving instructions from the Lord. They see the thunder. They they see what's going on. And they got impatient that what God said was going to happen was going to happen. And so they had everybody give them their gold that they took out of Egypt. We're going to melt it down, and we're going to make a calf that now listens to us. We're going to mold it in our image. And our likeness, is it, it, and, and it will answer, and we'll worship it. I, I, how many golden calves have we constructed in our life because we choose to resist the lordship of the Lord? Is anybody listening to this? Amen. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. i got to hurry. Proverbs 16, 9. 
A man's heart devises his own way. So th- this shows a separation, okay? If I choose not to submit to his lordship, then my heart will come up with its own pattern of handling things. My own way. This is my way. And, what, and this, is this is what the problem is, is we'll put it underneath, well, God told me. I'm above reproach because I could say God told me. Well, I could probably tell you within five seconds if you say God told you, if it doesn't line up with the word, God didn't tell you. If, if the word God spoke to you doesn't line up with his will, doesn't line up with his word, doesn't line up with his character, doesn't line up with the spirit, God didn't tell you that. God didn't tell you that. But you, you can't argue me because, because I said God said. No, I could tell you right now God didn't say that. And, and we don't understand that if I don't submit to his lordship, then a lot of times the voices that I'm hearing are my own heart. My own devices, my own counsel. Remember Ephesians. He listens to his own counsel, not mine. But if I submit to it, then his will now becomes my heart. And now my heart will do his will because it's surrendered. Next verse. This making sense? Proverbs 19, 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. I challenge you to find one verse in the Bible that says, follow your heart. Man, it's so popular nowadays. Just follow your heart. I'm not following my heart. My heart's wicked and sinful and deceiving. My heart will do a great job of convincing me this is God. Oh, no, this, this is God. Put it, under the, put it on the fire of the altar and let's see what God has to say about that thought. And see, that's what happens when I choose to submit it to the, every action, everything I choose to do, every attitude, every decision. I'm going to lay it on the altar before I choose to do what my heart wants to do. And I will submit it to his lordship and say, God, let your fire try it. And after the fire tries it, if it comes out knowing it is you, then you and you alone is what I will obey. Let me close with this thought. God's authority is displayed in many different ways. When we submit to his authority, we also submit to his outlined way of doing things. It's funny, I, this, is the, this, is the, this is kind of the famous thing you hear in church today. I don't have to be a part of a church. Where do you get that? God told me. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. (laughs) Why? Because his word says differently. I don't have to submit to spiritual authority. Who told you? God told you. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Whether it is the authority structure of the home, the authority structure of the church, the authority structure of your job, the authority structure of delegated authorities in society, what God has done is he has his authority and then he delegated it to certain areas on the planet to make sure it's carried out. God is sovereign, we are not, and that's why the whole concept of kingdom living, listen to this, seems foreign to most of us in America. Why? Because we were born in a country that is a democracy, and the kingdom is not a democracy. What is a democracy? A democracy means we rule the government. We vote them in, we vote them out. It's not communism, it's not socialism, and it's not ran by a king. It is democracy. Basically, if you look in the original writings of our government, we are a republic. And to the republic for which it stands, a republic is a state or a nation in which supreme power is held by the people. 
and their elected representatives are the ones that control rather than a monarch. What do I mean by that? Yes, we are a democracy, but above that, we are a republic. What's that mean? We are the United States. We have 50 different states that are ran united, but separate. They have their own governor. They have their own senate. They have their own rule. Each different state has their own set of rules different than... Uh, now we have a constitution, and we have a bill of rights, and we have to submit to that. But we are a republic. And then we send representatives from our state to Washington, D.C. to represent our state's needs. And if I'm the governor of Indiana, I'm not representing Kentucky or Ohio or Illinois. I'm there to meet the needs of Indiana. And if there's something that affects what's in my state, well, what's in my state? Farmers, blue-collar worker, other things that affect my state that aren't in other states. And so, as a rep are you getting this? I'm going to go to the government above me, and I'm going to represent... This is, this is, and that's great. It's a great structure for a nation because when America was founded, they didn't want to be underneath the rule of a king from England when they became overtaxed. And so they said, no, we want to be the United States. We want to be our own sovereign nation outside of the rule of the king of England and the queen. And of course, a revolutionary war was fought and then we became a nation and that's in the history books. This is the problem. That's not how the kingdom operates. And those of us that are in America have a hard time understanding kingdom concepts with a Western mindset. And we think the church in America can be ran by democracy and like a republic when God says, no, I run things as a theocracy. What's a theocracy? A system ran by delegated officials established by a divine guidance appointed by a sovereign God. Well, what's that mean? Right here is our constitution. God wrote it. He's our sovereign. He's our authority. And this is the rule of how we live our lives and how we run the church. It's, it's funny, I hear people, I don't, I don't need to be part of a church. Rip out three-fourths of the New Testament. Rip out half of the book of Acts, which after the day of Pentecost, when the church began to grow, they began to establish structure in the church and appoint leaders on how to rip that out. And then when you go over to uh, First and Second Corinthians, which are letters written to the book of Corinth on how to run a church service, how to run a church, rip rip that out, and then go over to 2 Corinthians and, and rip that out, and then go to Galatians, which is a letter written to the church of Galatia on how to run a church and how to deal with leaders and who's qualified to be a leader. Rip that out, and then go over to Ephesians, which is a letter written to the church at, at Ephesus, and all of a sudden in there, you, you, you see about the office gifts, and are you getting this? And, and well, you might as well just rip that out too. And while we're at it, let's rip, rip out Philippians, which was a church, which written to the church at Philippi, and Colossians, which was written to the church at Colossus, and First and Second Thessalonians, which were letters written to the church at Thessalonica. And we might as well rip out First and Second Timothy, because Timothy was a pastor receiving instructions by Paul that God gave him instructions on how to tell Timothy how to run a church. And in First and Second Timothy, who's qualified to be a minister, who's qualified to do ministry, what disqualifies what. Well, you might as well rip that out too. And you might as well rip out Titus because that's written. And uh, Philemon. And, you know, while we're at it, let's rip out First and Second Peter and James because James is written to the church and talks about how to run a church service, how to allow things to, and what to do with people in church that are causing trouble. And then while we're at it, when we make it now back to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, you might as well rip out the first part of the book of Revelation, because in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, is Jesus confronting the church, speaking to the pastor of the church, telling the pastor, these things are going on in your church, and I'm giving you instructions on how to deal with it. Does this make sense now? I don't answer to me. I don't know. I, how are you going to deal with that? It's because we're trying to see kingdom rule through the eyes of Western culture 
Let's put this next quote up here. We're going to end with these two quotes. C.S. Lewis said this. In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. That's why we have a problem with it, because we want to be God. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you don't know God at all. Let's put the next... Lordship is accepting God's sovereignty in my life. I don't have a graphic on this, but let me close with this. Half century ago, a Christian writer wrote this. I saw in a flash that all man-made kingdoms are shakable. The kingdom of communism is shakable. They've, told, they've held it together by purges, and they've held it together by force. But they can't relax those forces, for if they do, it will fall apart. The kingdom of capitalism is shakable. The daily fluctuation of the stock market on account of a course of events is proof that it is shakable. The kingdom of self is shakable. Center yourself on yourself as the center of yourself, and your kingdom will go to pieces. The kingdom of health is shakable. News media blares constantly about supposed health remedies to hold this physical body together, but we all realize <laughs> in the end, our body is given over to death. Therefore, every kingdom on this planet is shakable, except one, the kingdom of God. This is the only unshakable kingdom. Stand with me.